Amen. Uh, what? 527. Uh. 
Amen. We're going to go to 328 now. We're going to sing. I think I want to see what we're going to sing in a second. If you think about it like this, the Bible is God's love letter to us. Amen. And if you sing those words from the bottom of your heart, we say down south, or from your bowels, the Bible would say, if you sing it and you meet it, that's kind of a love song back to the Lord. I'm Amen. coming to you just as I am. But isn't it awesome? It says, any him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Amen. It's awesome. When we come to him, we're his forever. But it's even more amazing to me that he'll take us just like we are. But he loves us too much to leave us that way. Amen. 328. I hadn't been turned in there, so let me turn over it quickly. We're going to sing one and four. That's all we're going to do. kind of tells you what sort of fella he was. This this fella is, oh, I don't know, he's probably 10 or more years younger than me, <clears throat> uh, pastor somewhere in South Carolina, <coughs> and they had a church to burn down a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago. He said, a couple of weeks afterwards, UPS driver showed up and said, I have a truckload of stuff for the pastor. And it was actually all from Charles Stanley. And he had sent him a copy. He said, I understand that your library burned and you could probably get some better books, but here's all the books I've ever written. There's a copy of every one. And in one of those was an encouraging letter to say, hey, I suffered a fire once. I heard about your fire. Hope this is a blessing to you. You know, you think of these big names like that, and you don't, you don't see, or maybe you don't think they touch individual lives because of the platform that they are on. But uh, I said,
simply responded to his thing. My dad had similar stories of Jerry Falwell, Dr. Lee Robertson, and some other well-known pastors. In the, in the 70s, my dad saved up enough money to have enough fuel to, to make an extra drive of about an hour and a half from the house to hear Lee Robertson preaching. If you didn't grow up in independent Baptist circles, almost all those preachers write a bunch of books. And they typically say, you know, these are normally $10 a piece, but tonight you can have these three for $10. Something along those lines. And Dad had $5 he'd squirreled away. And uh, he asked the man which book would he, he thought he could have for $5. Actually, that's not the way it went. Dad wrote him a letter and put the $5 in it and said, you offered these books you know, three for ten, so I figured they're five or six dollars a piece. I've been able to put back this five dollars. Uh, which, uh, which book, whatever book you think is best, you mail to me. And he mailed him like six or eight books with the five dollars back in there, whatever. So you never know what your kindness to people do. Here are these, you look at these famous men. There's one other guy, you know, towards the end, I know it's a rabbit trail, but I. I think it's important for us to see these things. In the late 80s and, and, and into the 90s, Gary Falwell went some directions that, that I wouldn't approve of. Okay, he did some things I wouldn't approve of. But I didn't dislike him over that, even though there, there, there's a fellow I went to Bible college with who won't talk to me today because he was running Jerry Falwell down, and I knew quite a little bit about Jerry Falwell's ministry, and uh, I just told him he needed to shut up. I said, you know, that fellow did more in the first year of his ministry than I hope to do in my life. He started with 35 people, and on the first anniversary, he had 800 and some odd. And uh, there's another preacher a little older than me. He's now the dean of men out at West Coast. He actually was on staff at another independent Baptist college, and a, a fellow preached a whole sermon, you know how Baptist preachers can be, about Jerry Falwell. And uh, take me a minute to come up with his name. I actually met him when he was pastoring in Michigan. But anyway, he went to, the, the man's name to preach the sermon was Bill Grady. He went to Bill Grady when the chapel service was over and said, if you ever preach, that sermon again in my presence, I'm going to whip you. He said, Jerry Falwell is a compromiser. Well, you can say that, but I was a barefoot little boy in the snows of Virginia, and a big old black Cadillac came by and stomped and backed up and said to me and my brother, why don't you have on shoes? I said, well, sir, we ain't got no shoes. And Jerry Falwell had the fellow that was with him get out, and they sat down and took off their shoes and gave them to the boys. Put, you, put those shoes on. We'll get back in the car, and I feel you'll be all right. Give me your address. And they sent over there some shoes and clothes for the kids and started picking them up for church. And now that man, that man who was just a kid on the side of the road without shoes on his feet in, in the early 70s, has been in ministry for 40 years. Man, when God says to love people, it's kind of leading into what I'm going to preach tonight. There is a reason behind it. We are demonstrating to them the love of God. Let's be in prayer for, excuse me for the rabbit trail, but let's be in prayer for the two uh, the two families that I mentioned, the Ron Hamilton family and, and the Charles Stanley family. And then Denise has had a visitor come to the church a couple of weeks in a row. And uh, she did not accept Christ Sunday, but Denise spent most of the 11 o'clock hour talking with the young lady and ended up uh, passing along to her one of the books that the ladies are doing in the wow, uh, Women of the Word, uh, Lies Women Believe and uh, the Truth That Sets Them Free. And I don't know, a day or two later, she told Denise she'd already read a couple of chapters and you got to show me how to look these scriptures
scriptures up. I've never had a Bible before, so I don't understand Luke 4, 11 or whatever. And so she showed her how to do that. So the Lord is working uh, in our area. And most of you know that, that me and Phil and, and Nathan went to a big biker rally. And one of my friends, Thomas Phillippe, is back here in the Planet Church. Uh, he's the one who originally invited me to take part in that. So we're glad he's here tonight. Mm -hmm. But does anybody have any other prayer requests before I get to preaching? Yes, sir. Uh, Friday from afternoon until evening. Robert's back, and then also on the 26th, 27th, uh, it was in the hospital and the hospital, uh, the surgery. Okay, so what's going on at Robert's first? He wants Robert's back, uh, hopefully first in the afternoon, enjoying watching the remote control. Okay, I thought that was last Friday. That's this Friday or that next this Friday? This uh, coming Friday. Uh, See, I thought it was last Friday, and you got your good weather. But okay, I got you. Uh, All right, the anybody evening group, uh, strongly, hopefully. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. You're leaving in the morning. Go to Romania to see Elisa get married. Safe travels and low stress for Elisa. Right. Let's sum it up. And then on the 23rd, yeah, I'm going to let you tell them. Because I hadn't even told Denise, you know, that's our anniversary. So I have two dates on the 23rd. She said 22nd. I think it's 22nd. I thought she said the 23rd in the text. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, tell them about the 22nd. I have the visa appointment. Yay. So she has an appointment to talk with the U.S. about this eight-day visa, nine-day visa, whatever it is, to go to this mission camp. So y'all pray about that. Anybody else? Go on one. So, a little girl I know named Addie was absent today. What is the last name? Morrison. Okay, it's a different Addie. <laughs> okay. All right. Addie Morrison, leukemia. Is this an Air Force job? I don't know. Uh, it's just a military job? Okay. Well, it is the month of the military job. So. Anyway, anybody else? Things I've learned in the fourth quarter of my ministry. In the first quarter of his ministry, the reason he went from, from take that first year of his ministry, the reason he went from 35 people in a Donald Duck bottling factory to 850 in a local football field is because during that year he knocked 100 doors every day. Not somebody in the church, but he himself. 100 doors a day. That was a different time in American society, and, and, and people were mostly home in the days. At least the wife was probably home during the day. And, he, of course, he tried to give them a witness, but he also gave, he, if they said they went to church, he said, oh, that's great. Where do you go to church? And if they told him the name of the church, he'd say, who's the pastor? And frankly, a lot of people will tell you they go to church here, but they don't know the last three pastors. You know what I'm saying? So if they did that, he didn't scold them. He didn't make them necessarily, you know, he didn't call them out. He just said, well, if you ever need a pastor, here's my card. Give me a call. hundred doors a day. 
And he did all those sorts of things. And so in the late 80s and 90s, he tried some things that most of us would consider a little far out. And I'm not going to get into all the different things that he tried. But in that last quarter of his ministry, he went back and he said, you know, it's, it's telling people the gospel. That's what changed his life. I tried in the third quarter of my ministry a lot of things that people said were cutting edge. And it did not produce the converts like just giving the gospel and giving the gospel and giving. See, so he tried to, in an effort to win more people to Christ, he tried some things that maybe we didn't like. But when he realized they didn't work, he went back to what this says. We all make mistakes. Jesus said to those people that were trying to stone the lady for being in adultery, Whichever one of y'all has no sin, that's who throws the first stone. Of course, they put down stones and walked away. Okay? So enough about Jerry Falwell. Let's get to James chapter 2. Last week, we talked about three things that are certain. Can anybody tell me the three things we talked about that were certain last week? Help us get through trials and tribulations. Ah, well, there it can. Let's see it. That's exactly right, man. Give that man a hand. The purpose, the goodness, and the word of God are sure. Remember we talked about, it said it works in the gym. I was, I, I got some kind of catch in my shoulder. And I, I was doing presses with dumbbells today. And if that catch goes wrong, I drop that dumbbell from my left hand. I just, but I can stop. I can pick it up and I can go again, right? No, no pain, no gain, all right? That same thing is true of our Christian life. We don't grow closer to God without some trials to let us see that we can walk with God. God allows these difficulties, these trials, these tests to mature us and bring out Christ's likeness that he affords us in Christ, okay? God does allow take Satan to tempt us or to entice us, but why does Satan? So God allows these, these testings, these trials to make us more like Christ why does Satan tempt us? God's trying to bring out the best in us. What is Satan trying to bring out in us? The worst. The worst in us. That's exactly right. All right? We, but you've got to remember, we are more than conquerors. The Bible says in Romans 8, 37, through Christ. I, I, I don't often quote the Greek. Number one, I'm not real fluent in Greek. Number two, I don't want to seem like one of them know-it-alls. But I really like the Greek word behind more than conquerors is one Greek word. The word is Nike or Nike, and it has a prefix, hyper. Hyper Nike. To me, that's really easy to remember. Hyper is when something is like on steroids, right? Uh -huh. So we're conquerors on steroids in Christ Jesus. But tonight... We want to look at how our faith is proved. We read through it. We saw, or I'm going to try to teach you from the scriptures, that our faith is proved not to God, because he can see your heart and know. Man looks on the outward, God looks on the inward. Our faith is proved to ourselves and to society and to other saints <coughs> by our love and our labor. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, I'm going to flip back there and read it to you, make sure I get it right. Uh, Paul says, For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You can say it like this. I, I grew up an independent Baptist, and if you didn't comb your hair the right way, I mean, honestly, some Baptists made fun of my daddy for wearing cowboy boots. Okay? Some Baptists, uh, you hear me out? Some ba my dad wore, uh, until his glasses got too thick and heavy, he wore what they call wire rim glasses. There's a little thin piece of metal came here, it was around each lens. And because they had a brass uh, shape to them, there were people who said, oh, that's too showy. Look at that. Look at that. That's worldly. That's the same kind of glasses Hank Jr. wears. I mean, this is silliness that we do. Okay. And so 
Uh, my dad dressed a certain way when he was preaching. I typically dress that way on Sundays. I don't necessarily dress that way on Wednesdays, obviously. My dad always wore a tie and most of the time had it on a jacket when he was preaching. But we can get tied up in these outward things and you don't want to admit it. But we can become very pharisaical. In other words, the Pharisees were, boy, who had the longest garments? Who had the cleanest garments? Who had this? Who had that? Whose little curly cues was just right? Whose little Bible was bigger than the next guy's Bible? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm reminded of an old John Wayne movie where a lady says she has the Bible. And he said, well, Judge so and so has got one too. And his is a big one. You know, as if the size of your Bible makes you more Christian, right? Uh, but here's some newsflash. It's real easy, and I think our culture, and it's, it's in the church, our culture likes to cancel anyone that we don't agree with. So it's easy to point back at my dad's generation or some of the leaders in that movement today and say, look at those Pharisees because of how they dress. Okay? That, they think that, that sums up Christianity because they wear a white shirt when they preach or this, that, and the other thing. Okay, there's some truth in that. But Romans chapter 2, verse 1 says, Be careful, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, but wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Mm -hmm. So if you look to a lot of the modern preachers who wear their shirt untucked all the time, who preach in jeans, and I know one fellow, he used to take off his, his shoe, I'm not going to call his name, but he used to take off his shoes when he was preaching because he was on holy ground. Now, Brother Derek, that sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds like he's pulling the Bible out of there. But what he was trying to do was make up for the fact he was on wife number four. Amen. You know, well, a lot of that stuff that people do on the modern end, and they look back and they point and say, look how pharisaical they are. But you've got to remember what my daddy said again. When I point a finger at Phil, there's three pointing back at me. When we point a finger at these people that are upset over how you dress when you come to church, we're upset over how they dress when they come to church. You feel me? Okay? Our love is proven. Our faith is proven in our love. The basic idea is that Bible faith is not dead. As I said again, it reveals itself by our love and by our labor. Too many have an intellectual belief. What do we mean by an intellectual belief? Y'all talk back to me. So far, ain't too many people talking back to me. But tell me what we're talking about when we say someone has an intellectual belief. It's head knowledge versus heart uh, knowledge. Uh, like they... they they think about it and they might believe it's factual or whatever, but they don't have a relationship and stuff with Christ. Very well stated. They understand the historic person of Christ, but there's a difference in the historic person in Christ. And, and, and I used to, I don't remember who preached now, but I heard a sermon. I don't know, this was 18 inches in my short self, uh -huh. in my head, in my heart. But I used to hear a sermon, uh, Missing Heaven by 18 inches. Uh -huh. Just because you know who. Who Christ is doesn't mean you know Christ, right? Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. But ladies, if you meet a fella, ladies that are not married, you meet a fella and he says he's a Christian, but he's not a member of a church, you need to back up off of him because he ain't serious about his faith. Because there ain't nothing in that Bible that talks about running around and not being part of a local church. All right? <clears throat> A lot of people can answer. Uh, Denise can, if she were in the room, I don't know where she's at. Maybe with the baby. No, not with the baby. <laughs> I'm right here. You're right there. Well, <laughs> I was looking for you someplace else. So she can probably bear me witness on this. But in 15 years in Monroe County, Mississippi, I met exactly two people who didn't say they were saved. Drug dealer. Drunkard. They can answer all the questions right, brother there. If you say, do you understand that God loves you? They say, yeah. Quote John 3.16. Do 
You understand you're a sinner? Yeah, all the sinners sort of lose the Romans chapter 3. You understand that you have to be saved? Yeah, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and I have called upon the name of the Lord. If it doesn't change, I don't know how many ways I can say it. I know I say some things over and over. Part of that's because I'm getting old. And part of that is because it's a good way to say it. If Denise moved in my house, and bear with me, my wardrobe changed. She threw out a bunch of clothes I really liked. <clears throat> the art I had displayed changed. Hmm? I had this African mask a buddy of mine painted. The screen was six foot by six foot. She said, that's got to go. <laughs> that, I, I've, been, I've been in West Africa, in East Africa where that's at, and that's voodoo stuff right there, and that ain't, gonna, I ain't no voodoo in my house. Shouldn't our lives change? Mm -hmm. If the Lord Jesus Christ, the Creator, the Redeemer, moved in, shouldn't our life be different? That's what we see here in James chapter 2, okay? Faith by love. He says in the first verse, Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to person. The, the words have not are more easily explained with the words practice not. Don't practice the faith of the Lord with respect to person. Excuse me. Our faith, what is faith? I said I was going to be done by eight, so y'all talk quicker. It's faith in some brownie points this week, girl. Forsaking all, I trust him. That's faith. I'm putting everything in him. Do I believe that chair will hold me? Yeah, I believe that chair will hold me. And I'll just flop down in the old thing, all right? Do I believe that Christ can take care of me? Yes, and I trust him to take care of me, even when I can't see the way forward. <clears throat> our, our faith should be exhibited moment by moment in our daily life. We, we don't believe in God in some vain, excuse me, vague or general way. Like, honestly, all the demons believe in God in a, in a general way. Uh, we read here that the devils believe and tremble. But the sad fact is that there's a lot of people that sit in church three times a week that believe in God the same way the devil does. We must have a faith, a very personal and life-changing faith in Jesus Christ. It's not a hope-so faith that saves your soul. It's a definite commitment to the Son of God, Jesus Christ the Lord. Here, in the first verse, he is called uh, Christ the Lord of glory. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 1, let's look, let, let, let look back a little Oops, hold on. This is talking about Jesus. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, when did the last days begin when Christ ascended? Okay. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, verse 3, by Christ. The worlds were made, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Notice he didn't need my help. Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He is the God of glory. To the Jews reading this letter, the glory identified Christ with the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament. That glory that was in the tabernacle and in the temple, okay? That glory now dwells in the believer and in the church. So bear with me. I'm going to read you some verses. In John chapter 17, we, we, we call...
call, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc. From Matthew chapter uh, 6, uh, we call that the Lord's Prayer. That's actually the model prayer. The disciples said, how do we pray? And he's teaching them how to pray. He said, when you pray, pray after this manner. He didn't say repeat these words like we do down south at, at football games. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's like a little shotgun, I mean a little machine gun of the verse. No, that's, that's how you pray. In John 17, he actually prays in part of that prayer. Listen to this, verse 22. The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. The glory that God gave Christ, Christ gives us so that we can be like-minded. We can be Amen. in accord. In Colossians chapter 1, the Bible says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is this mystery among the Gentiles? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 3. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now some people refer to heaven as glory with a capital G. But these G's aren't capitalized. It is not talking about the place of heaven. It is talking about Christ being manifested in my life and in your life as we draw closer to Him. Romans chapter 8, verse 30. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, then He also called, whom He called, then He also justified, and whom He justified, then He also glorified. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. Amen. Okay, two people. <coughs> Say, let's try that one more time. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. Amen. Okay, five people are saved. But the fact of the matter is, if you're saved, then you're glorified. Amen. Okay? Not my word. It's the word of Scripture. So how do we show this love, this glory, this Christ likeness to others? Let me tell you, this is not in my notes. Let me tell you what it's not. It's not picking everything they do apart. It's not talking to them like they're a dog. It's not running them down. Even though sometimes when we're running them down, we're running them down because of their sin. And their sin is wrong. But we have to love them and hate the sin. Now in today's world, they may accuse you of not loving them because you don't approve of their sin. But we have to go by the scriptures. And the scripture says, if I love them, I'm going to tell them about Jesus. And in order to, for people to understand the good news of Jesus, they do have to understand the bad news of judgment for sin. Okay? <clears throat> we, don't, we don't judge them. We tell them what the scripture says says about them. Uh, preferring the rich over the poor, that's a terrible sin. Why? You tell me, why? Why is it terrible to, judge, to, to take the, the rich over the poor? Oh, nobody's jumping at it, so I guess I'll answer it. Was Christ born in a hospital? Did he have an incubator? Did he have three doctors on hand to make sure everything went well? Two RNs, three orderlies. Near as I can tell, he was born in a barn with just his mother and his stepfather to take care of him. He was laid in a trough. You see, Christ, the Lord of glory, was made poor that you might be made rich eternally through his sacrifice. Romans 2. There's no respect of persons with God. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I charge thee. This is like a military assignment. I charge thee by the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another doing nothing by partiality. So, so James makes it clear. That when a poor man comes into the assembly, the local church, he is to be received and shown.
shown the same respect, mercy, love, and grace as the rich man. Mm -hmm. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Mm -hmm. Honestly, you and I can't get burned by looking on the outward appearance, and then we still go back and do it again. I wouldn't do that, preacher. So you're better than Samuel? Samuel told Saul because Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else, and Samuel almost chose David's older brother because he was a big, good-looking fella. And God said, no, that ain't him. You done made that mistake once. And they choose a, a little uh, red-complected shepherd boy Amen. and anointed him king. Okay? The gold ring man, the flashy dresser, it says gay apparel. We know that word has changed use in the, in the last... 75 years. It means bright, cheerful, flashy, if you will. He's no more valuable in God's sight than the poor person in drab or plain clothing. Jesus had already corrected the Jews about uh, desiring or respecting the places of honor. Listen to this. I got to get in high gear so I can keep my word and be done by 8 o'clock. I got 13 minutes. In Luke 14, I'm just going to read you one text. Luke 14, verses 7 to 11. He put forth a peril to the, a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit down not in the highest room, lest a more honorable man then thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee come, and he may say unto thee, O friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have thy worship in the presence of them that sit and meet with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and the humble he who humbleth himself shall be exalted. We run after men of fame and glamorous men. Glamour and fame have no eternal worth. Neither does poverty. Okay? It is not unusual. I was having a discussion with Leon about this earlier. There, there's a preacher that I knew growing up. And when I looked at his ministry, 30, 40 years in one spot. He never had more than 30 people. And when I was younger, I used to think, well, he's, he's doing something wrong. If he, wasn't, if, he wasn't, if he was doing it right, he'd have more than 35 people. But as I have matured, I look and I go, my goodness, he stayed there 40 years at the end of that road. There's a fellow in North Carolina that's got a church website, the church at the end of the road. Well, I know a man in Mississippi that pastored the church at the end of the road since about 1979. But he's been faithful. Honestly, that guy is more faithful and more Christ-like when I look at him through the lens of Scripture than a lot of people that are driving Cadillacs and pastoring churches of 500 or 1,000 people. He's been faithful. He's worked his fingers to the bone to be able to live and preach the gospel. Now, that's not always the case, but it is certainly not unusual for some of the godliest men to be poor. Mm -hmm. Now... Sometimes, it's not always the case, I can introduce you to rich men who love God and who give ridiculous amounts of their income to the Lord. But sometimes when we get financially successful, we become afraid of losing that success where that fellow that's working a job or two or three to make ends meet is concerned only about losing the blessing of God. In the eternal life, the blessing of God is much more important than nice clothes, nice house, etc. One more thing. What's wrong with showing respect to wealthy persons? Nothing if you show that same respect to everybody else.
walk through the door. Amen. Okay. But if we're showing respect to them, we become judges when only God can see their heart. The word partial used here in verse 4 takes us back to verse 8 in that double-minded man. So this shows a, a fakeness, a false judgment, because Christ clearly stated in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, and in Luke 6, chapter, uh, verse 20, that the poor inherit the earth. Amen. James reminds them the rich oppress the saints. The rich drag the saints to court. The rich even blaspheme the name that we're called by. You read older New Testament and God loves the poor. The Proverbs say it this way. He that oppresses the poor reproacheth the maker, but he that, lay, uh, that honoreth the poor hath mercy. He that honoreth, excuse me, he that honoreth God hath mercy on the poor. Uh -huh. And in verse 7 here, uh, do they not blaspheme? So that reminds us that the rich people take the name of the Lord in vain. But the royal law of the believer is given right here, verse 8, if you fulfill the royal law, is John 13, 35. By this shall all men know you, my disciples, if you have love one toward another. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. The first and greatest commandments love the Lord, the second is to love my uh, fellow man as I love myself. So, that's just two verses, preacher. You're taking that out of context. Okay. Galatians 5.14, all the law is fulfilled in one word, one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That includes the people that we don't like. Mm -hmm. That includes the people that we think are making wrong choices. Okay? Romans 13.8, oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law for this Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Amen. James 2, 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and offend in one point, is he guilty of all. What, what does that mean? Well, it's not the laws of God, it's the law of God. Okay? So, if I don't commit adultery, but I do steal, I've broken the law. I'm a lawbreaker. I don't commit adultery, I don't kill, but I did bear false witness. I'm a lawbreaker. Okay? So James is not putting us under the Old Testament law. Rather, he's reminding us of our place under God's moral expectations of the new covenant. Remember, uh, we, we read through Romans, we preached through Romans, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is much harder than the letter of the law. One more verse, and I'm going to try to fly through faith uh, proved in our labors. In 1 John... After that, not before it. First John four twenty. If a man say, "I love God and hateth his brother," he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Our faith is proved in our love. Our faith is proved in our labors. We gone through these verses here about the dead faith, the divine faith, uh, the devil faith, and the divine faith several times. But James is not contradicting what Paul taught about salvation. There are people that try to sit there, uh, you know, how, how do we know if we're, if we're, if we have no reason to be ashamed before God? It's not because of my denomination. It's not because of my doctrine. It's not because of my dress. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So one way I know that I have nothing to be ashamed of before God is if I understand the scriptures. So if I take this out of context, then I could falsely teach that we're saved by work. But this is a totally different look at it than Paul. Paul 
is writing of our justification before God. James is writing of our justification before our fellow man. So James is writing how we prove our love, not only to ourselves, but our, our faith, excuse me, not only to ourselves, but to other saints and to society. And you hear me quote somewhat regularly that salvation comes by God-given grace through God-given faith. But if I have God-given salvation, I'm going to have God-honoring works. Okay? Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The faith is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Okay? So, grace saved you through faith that God gave you, and then you're his workmanship, so you're going to be doing these things that he's ordained. Sometimes, we deny Christ by what we do. Being a Christian isn't as much a matter of what we say with our lips as it is a matter of what we do with our life. Not only do the great deeds of faith listed in Hebrews 11 reveal our faith, but the little things that we daily say and do prove our faith. Compare this text from 1 John, 1 John 3, 16 and 17. Hereby we, we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth uh, his brother have a need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. In other words, don't just talk about it, but in deed and in truth. And here we read, what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace and be warmed in the field, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith without works is dead. Verse 18 is kind of a challenge. Show me your faith without your works. Let me just tell you how you do that. Let me just tell you the possibility of that. If you speak English, the word you're looking for is it's impossible. If you speak French, the word you're looking for is impossible. If you speak Spanish, the word you're looking for is impossible. If you speak Italian, near as I can come to it, it's impossible. If you speak Icelandic, it's omnible. If you speak German, it's omnible. You cannot show somebody your faith without your actions. It's impossible. Matthew 8, 29. Look, even the devils recognize the historic person and authority of Christ. Matthew 8. Behold, they, the demons in this man, cried out, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Mark 1. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Luke 4. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Let us alone. Mark 5. They cried with a loud voice, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? Acts 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. The demons are who was talking in every one of those <laughs> verses. The demons, the devils, who will spend eternity in hell, recognize the person of Christ. It's more than just knowing who he is. That kind of faith will not save them. James reaches all the way back to the, we talk about the divine faith. James reaches all the way back to the Old Testament. He talks about Abraham and he talks about Rahab. Abraham, we know that story real well. He believed God. He proved it by leaving everything he knew to go where God said. He proved it again when God said, hey, sacrifice your son. He believed that God was going to raise Isaac up again. He took him on that mountain to slaughter him. You have to understand, when they when they did these sacrifices, it wasn't just, oh, lay it up there and, 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 and somehow, you know, give it an injection of saline and it dies. No, they cut his throat, they caught the blood, they put the 
blood in certain places. They took the breast cuts of meat and put it on the fire. They took the intros and other things and took them without the camp and fire. This, this, this wasn't no, hey, uh, uh, Benny Hinn hit somebody in the head and then come back. This is going to take a, a mighty miracle of God to put the body back together. You understand? Now, did God make him do it? No. God showed him how much he trusted God. He allowed that trial to show him how much he trusted God. Joshua, we, we don't have time because I said it's going to be done at 8 and it's 8.01. We, we don't have time to read all these scriptures about Rahab, but let me just tell you this. She's listed. Rahab was a whore. She was a harlot at some point in her life. She was known by that. But if you read Joshua and Hebrews, it seems that the word of how God was working in the Israelites, that she believed on God before they got there. She said, hey, I already heard. Let me take care of you. That is an action proving she's already believed on God. She didn't do that to earn her salvation. She did that because God already given her the salvation. Okay? Verse 24 of James 2 sums up the whole matter of our faith being proved by our love and our labor. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Justified in front of other people. Okay? Multitudes of people today who profess to be Christian have a dead faith rather than a saving faith. They profess God with their lips, but like he said in Titus, they deny him with their life. Paul explained, they profess they know God, but in works they deny him. Real Christians are peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's why, that's Titus 2.14. That's why Paul warns in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove or test yourself. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except to be reprobate. Now this doesn't mean that true Christians will ever lose their salvation. Neither does it mean true Christians will ever be sinless. If you took the time to read 1 John 1, verses 5 to 10, you'd say, if you, you would see, if you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself, and, and the truth, Christ, is not in you if you say you're not a sinner. He said every man sin. But when we sin as believers, what do we do? He says, if we're faithful, uh, excuse me, he says, if we confess our sins, not our sin, we get saved by confessing the sin of unbelief. Lord, forgive me of my sin and take my life. We get sanctified by cataloging our sins before God. Now, you don't have to come to me and kiss my ring and say, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. I can't find it anywhere in the Bible. But I am to address the Heavenly Father in the name of His Son, Jesus, who paid for my salvation and say, this is how a lot of us pray. Lord, if I failed you today, forgive me. What He wants is, Lord, I lost my temper with so-and-so today. Would you forgive me? Help me to make that right so that I can continue to disciple that person or teach that person or draw that person to you or whatever. Lord, I hit my hand with that hammer and a dirty word came out my mouth and I am so embarrassed I said that. Would you forgive me? You see, that's what Christians do because we're Christians not to earn our salvation but to keep his love. If Nathan does something that I dislike he can break the fellowship between me and him. I am his father. But he will never cease to be my son. Amen. The fellowship, that's on both of us because I'm human to maintain it. But he can never cease to be my son. Mm -hmm. If you truly know Christ, and I'm going to tell you, two people, it's 8.05, I'm going to shut up, I promise. Two people know if you're really saved or not. That's you and the Lord Jesus. You and the Lord Jesus. You really saved? 
you want to prove to other people what a great God you serve. Amen. You want to prove Amen. to the other saints what a great God you serve. Because you can say what you want to, but there's not one of us that doesn't at times have grumpy. I, I, a man asked me what I was preaching Sunday, and I told him. And he begins to tell me how I need to reword it. That's really hard for the preacher to take, you know. I've been doing this a little while. What I tried to get him to see was all of us, we have times when we are so close to God. You know that person. I don't want to preach Sunday sermon. But they walk in a room and you can just smell Jesus all over them. You can just see Jesus all over them. And then we have those times when we're there. But we really aren't where we need to be with Him. The ninth sermon is for believers. We prove our faith and thereby we glorify God. By how we love people and how we labor for the Master. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for all those that came out tonight, Lord. What a great Wednesday night crowd. I pray that you would help us as we go out to our homes and to our jobs tomorrow and to various things, Lord. I don't know what all concerns and, and, and difficulties this crowd faces, Lord. But as we go out of here, I thank you first for your salvation. I thank you... Secondly, for their love. And I pray that you would help us to reflect your love and your salvation to other people outside the church as well as we reflect it to one another within the church. For it's in Christ's name we ask it all. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.